Okay, so as promised, I would like to show you a few things this afternoon. First, a couple of things that may come in handy. Um, and I think I forgot to open one tab here, I'll find that later. Um, and then also saying something more about how to form groups. And then a little bit about how you can kind of combine code and text to form documents in an easy way. So the first thing is this regarding departure from normality, how much does it actually matter? And maybe as a comment to that, I think it was you asking yesterday about what is the difference between the Wilcox test and the KS, Kolmogorov Smirnov test, to test for departure for, um, not the Wilcox, yeah, to, to compare two distributions. And they're quite different in the way that they are working. So what we did the other day was to look at Wilcox test and say it's a rank sum test. Hopefully you recall that. What the Commodore's Munich test is doing is to look at the cumulative distribution function. So if you have two samples, you look at the empirical distribution function, it will be kind of a stairway. I'm just doing something here. Oops, it's not going down. Something like this. That's one sample, and then you have another sample. Maybe just to do something different. Now, what you do if you do the Wilcox test is that you look at the ordering of the different points. In this case, the ordering is actually such that the red one here just has a higher variance, but the mean value is about the same. So the sum of the ranks may not differ so much. But what the Common Cross Miller test does is that it looks at every point here, it looks at the vertical difference between the, the function. And it finds the place where the vertical distance is highest. It may be there, depending on whether it's actually there, depending on my skills in drawing. So it looks at the highest vertical difference between the two. That's what the Kolmogorov mirror test does. There's another, yet another function called Anderson Darling test, something like that. Um, that looks at the integral of the square difference and look at a skill score for that. So basically, those measures are totally different, have different properties, have different sensitivities to different things. And that's how life is. So some tests, tests have one, you can see, is very good at detecting some departures, others are different. So what the Wilcox is doing, similar to the t-test, is to look for difference in mean values. Here I have a difference in distribution because I have different variances, but I may not have a difference in mean. So again, it depends on the question. Again, testing normality to get back to what we want to do. We want to look at normal distributed data. Here I sampled 100 observations from a random normal number generator. It looks great. If I do it again, it looks a little bit different. What you should notice is out in the tails, sometimes it actually gets close to the border. Sometimes it's outside. Sometimes it's quite far outside. And sometimes you have some weird wiggly things at towards the ends. This is the best I can get with a random number generator. So you just have to keep that variation in mind when you look at the plots that you're looking at. Now I'll just set the seed to be able to reproduce all the random numbers now will come in the same order as last time I did it. So there's a function called sapir.test, which is quite powerful at detecting things, whether things are normal or not. What I do is I, I run the 100 samples from the standard normal distribution, and then I pick the p-value. So I have this piece of code just give me the p-value, 
of this test for a new random sample each time I run it. There's this function called replicate. So now I'll do that 10,000 times just to get a distribution. So which distribution should I expect now? What is the, under the null hypothesis, the things are normal. Which distribution should I expect for those p-values? One. It's not. It, yeah, yeah, but that's in the linear regression. But here we're looking at p values. P values are always between zero and one, right? So, what is that you're testing? What is the meaning of a p value? That is how likely is it to get something that is as or more extreme under the null hypothesis than what you observed. So in order to do that, we should have a uniform distribution. So all p-values between 0 and 1 are equally likely when we have a random sample from a normal distribution. So that means when you... I made the bins here so they are 5% each. So we have exactly five, oh, very close to 5%, but well, let's just calculate it. <clears throat> How many of those are less than 5%? 4.7% of the 10,000 samples are less than 5%. So that's quite close. If I run it again, then my random, my results further down won't be the same, but let's just do it. The histogram is just the same, or slightly different. Here I have 0 0.049, so it's very close to 0 0.05 as expected when I simulate at random and do this. So that is if things are truly normal. Now what happens if things are not normal anymore? I should do a... QQ plot of this. So what I do is, instead of taking normal distributed data, I take data from a T distribution with 15 degrees of freedom. So it has heavier tails. It's not always that easy to see. But it's more likely that I have points outside in the tails than what I had before. At least every other plot here has something outside before. It was kind of only one or two that had it. So if I do the same thing, I test for normality of all these. Then, well, how many do I have there? In 14% of the cases, I will reject that they are normal. But in all the others, even though it's not normal, I will not be able to reject that they're normal in this case. So data is departing from the normality, not a whole lot, but some. If I do it not with 15 degrees of freedom, but five, let me just go up and show you how that looks like. Then you most often have something that is outside in one or both ends. So let's go down and try that 10,000 times. Now, in, in this case, in 56% of the cases, we can actually prove with a 5% level that it's a significant departure from normality. But in 44% of the cases, we cannot. So this is, you can say, the superior test, which is quite sensitive among the different tests for normality. The superior test is one of the more powerful ones. So this is the best we can get. Now, the t-test. I know it's testing something slightly different. But what we're talking about is how is the p-value for something departing from normality. So if I just take some normally distributed numbers 
and test for the p-value here, what do I get? Again, I get something that is very close to 5% and a uniform distribution as I should expect. At random, sometimes the mean value is different from zero, sometimes it's not. Again, I'll do the same 15 degrees of freedom. From a T statistics, I have heavier tails, but the mean does not change. I still have around 5% change there. And with the 5 degrees of freedom again, again, it really doesn't change. So the performance of the T statistic here for testing whether the mean is equal to zero, it doesn't matter if the tails are a bit too fat. What will happen is if I don't go with 5, but go down to, now I'll take a rather extreme one, 2 degrees of freedom. Then the tails are really fat, right? If I run the same here, where I change it down to 2, then I see something odd, right? What do I see here? Well, we're down to 4% where we can, at random, see a difference from zero. But we have kind of, it's not a uniform anymore, it's a, a totally different distribution. So what happens is that now that you have some very fat tails, two things are happening. One thing is that the mean depends a lot on the most extreme observation in one end or the other end. Let's go back. There's a big difference between minus 10 and plus 7 when you just do and minus 25. So that observation there has a large influence on the mean value. It also has another influence. It has a large influence on the estimate of the standard error. So what happens is that the estimated standard error will be much larger than what you should expect from the malady. Thereby, you're shifting, you're, you're making things, when you divide by that, you make things different. So that's why we have something that is slightly different here. But that is only when we do it with a very, very extreme case. So it's just to say that a small departure from normality doesn't hurt too much even though things, in this case, are quite frequent, somewhat outside. Where it will make a difference though, that is, in this case, I made something uh, where both tails are equally well heavy. If I make something where it's skewed some one way or the other, then I will have something where the t-test will also start to detect departure from normality, uh, departure different in mean values, but again, the superior test will be much more sensitive to departures than normality than the t-test is. So, and the same applies to see the ANOVA models and the linear regression models that you're doing, the, because the test statistic is again a t-test that is somewhere on the knee or an F statistic, and they are rather robust to departures even fairly large robust. That is not to say that you should not try to get things behaving as nice as possible, but it's just saying that even though you have something that doesn't look too nice, the p-values that you're looking at are still reasonably credible. Because the numbers that we got, okay, so it was not 5%, but it was 4%. So going with a 5% level is probably not too far off. Does that make somewhat sense? That, of course, things should be reasonably normal, and the more the, the merrier, of course, not to say that, but in practice, these tests are rather robust. Now I made it with 100 observations. Of course, 
this difference here depends on how many observations you have. Generally, I would always recommend have at least 30 samples whenever you have the option to do so, uh, but preferably more. Um, on the other hand, when you're playing around with small samples, it's easier to see some details, but to show the normality departure, you have to go up to quite some samples to see something. So that was one thing. A totally different story. It's some data with the ozone level measured somewhere in combination with wind measurement, temperature, and the solar radiation. I don't know if you know, but the ozone level in st at street level is in a balance with the oxygen level because of radiation. You can kind of get some free radicals and get some ozone, forgot exactly how it is, but there's a balance there between, so you always have a little bit of ozone. Unless you have a lot of diesel cars, then you can have more because it takes a while before that uh, quality establishes itself. So looking at the data that we have here, what we are interested in is compare, it's trying to explain the ozone level down here. And what we see when we look at the three different predictors, there's one thing that is quite obvious. The assumption about a linear relation is not fulfilled. Do you agree? So, what do we do about that? There are basically two ways getting about it. Well, at least at least two ways. One is to try to go just guess what could happen, what could be a good. You have to smooth the function there that's sufficient. Another way is to try to use some tools to help you out. So what we'll do now, I should actually go down to the second part instead. Get back to the tree in a moment. So-called GAM, which is short for Generalized Additive Models. So we cannot have interactions here. We only can only have things that are additive. It's from a library. I'll share the code so you can have it. So I make a model here, a GAM model instead of an LM. I use an S here to say I want something that is a spline. So a spline is a kind of family of smooth functions. But otherwise, it's very similar to an LM. Now, if I plot this model, then it shows me for each of these variables here, it fits a spline when I allow it to fit a spline. And then it gives me how many degrees of freedom is it using, similar to what is the degree of a polynomial that this is corresponding to. So this is like a third order, this is like a fourth order polynomial, and a third order again down here. So what we can also use it for is to get inspired as to, well, maybe it's not a third order, maybe at least what we need is a quadratic term. And maybe radiation, yes, it does make a small twist here, but it's actually almost linear. So within the interval there, the 95% interval, you can up there for the radiation, you can draw a line reasonably well. The tick mark at the bottom, that is where you have observations, just as information. So now we can start playing making models. So if you want the temperature, we're on a second order term there, just to try that. Then if you do a summary of this model, it actually did not do what I wanted it to do because it shows me the temperature, not the temperature square. That is because when you multiply things together, it wants to make, make interactions. But the interaction with yourself is just yourself. We'll talk in more detail about, detail about that tomorrow. Um, but if you want to have the square term, you need to put this identity operator around it. Then you can make any calculation in here. And now I have a square term and a totally different coefficient. So based on what I saw there, 
I will want to have the temperature square. I did not actually put it in there. I should add it here. Plus I of temp oops square. <clears throat> the other thing I did in here that's a mean one. Can you guess what happens? There are two parts in it's the identity, so it does a calculation first. Here is a logical operator. Gives you true or false. True is the same as a one. False is the same as zero. And then it multiplies with wind minus ten. So what is this doing? Yes? Exactly. So in practice, what it means, if you have a 10 here, then you also have a wind on its own up there. So you have a slope that comes from the wind part here. And then what you have is when you get to 10, what happens there? Maybe I should have drawn it with a negative slope. This is the dependence on wind. But when it gets to 10 down here, it flattens out. So it means that I can change the slope just as you did with your factors right now. So what happened in practice, you're predicting what is now the full drawn piecewise linear function. So you change the slope when the wind is above 10 with a certain estimate. So let's look at just a summary of this one here. Actually, everything here is significant. So what I wrote the next part here was not actually In my code, I just assumed that I got to this model here, um, but let's just use the other model there instead. That's fine. Um, it's probably better. I don't know. We could test them because they are actually nested. Um, so let me just plot the summary again here so we can see it all. So what is the slope when the wind is above so when the wind is below 10 meters per second, the slope is minus 7.6. When the wind gets above, you have to add this estimate with that estimate. So effectively, the slope is zero, because the sum of those two coefficients is virtually zero. So effectively, the slope becomes zero above 10, sort of like it looks like in data. Let's just plot the diagnostic plots. This is one I dislike. Now I don't know if I... Yes. So why do I dislike this one? If you look at the scale location plot, you can also see it up here at the residuals fiddles. The variance here in the beginning is fairly small and then it increases. You don't have as many points out here, but the variance still appears larger. What you also see here it starts at around 0.5. There are many observations here and it keeps increasing up till around 70 and then it doesn't increase that much further, but there's not that many observations up here. So you need to consider a transformation of your response, most likely, to do this. And that was why I have the other model here with the log ozone 
as my response to reduce the variance of large values and increase it for smaller values. Here the intercept is not significant, I could remove it, um, I won't do it now. If I plot the diagnostic plot for this model, what sticks out is observation 17 down here with a standardized residual of, of a minus 4. It doesn't have too large a leverage, so it's not, it's sitting down there, so it's not outside Cook's distance here. So it's not that I need to remove it. Maybe I was actually a little bit too drastic in my variance reduction. So probably I should go back and not do a log, but a square root. And now this is a, at least nice, and I don't have that huge residual anymore, so I'm actually quite happy. What I should do now, I was cheating a little bit now, because I did one thing that I should have not, ah, th that was without, this is one is the width. I cheated a little bit, and I did one thing that I should not have done. It's a common mistake, I did it on purpose. When I changed the response, I did not go back and consider the original, which terms do I actually need to have in my model. I should go back and say, well, I also need to have this term as part of my potential model. So you go back to your largest model. Yes, in a moment. Now I see that I have a lot of things that are not significant and actually the least significant one is the wind square, which was significant before. The question is, but now I have both wind square and I have the piecewise linear with wind in the same model. That's probably not a good idea. This is probably one of the cases where I should either have it with a square or with a piecewise. And then I should compare the two with an AIC because they're not nested. Should I just be doing the appropriate thing? That would probably be good. So I have this model here. That was my model one. Then I make a model that is one that contains the piecewise linear part. Here I won't do the update because the term to write is so complex. I will just remove the, the squared term. And then I'll make one here that is with the squared term. Where I'll remove the piecewise linear part. And then I will look at the AIC of model one piecewise linear and for the model square and which model should I then pick? The piecewise linear one because it has the lowest AIC indeed. So out of those two models this is the one I should look at. So now let me look at a summary of that model. See if I need to do, and again, maybe I should remove the intercept. Should also do that for the square part here. Yes. So actually in both of these models, I will just redo it where I remove the intercept. But the conclusion is the same as expected. So now I have a model, a linear depends on temperature, wind and radiation and a piecewise linear added to the wind when it's above something. Of course I could optimize this 10 and not just use a 10 that I looked graphically, that was a good model. And now I don't need to remove any observations anymore, so I'll just delete that. One thing that is always good to do when you've made a model 
is to plot what I have here are the pre different predictors. You see, I look at the names up here. I want the temperature, the radiation, and the wind. And then I plot the, the residuals from the model on the y-axis. What I then do is I add the panel smoother. It's the same function that's done in the, in the pairs plot, just to see are there any tendencies left in the residuals so that I need to consider to improve my model. It's always good to look at the residuals, not just versus fitted values, but also versus both predictors that are in the model, but also predictors that are not currently used. So, this is a nice horizontal line. That one is also nice. The temperature dependence could be, I would say, it could be nicer. It goes a little bit up here in the left hand part, but on the other hand, you also have a small, a large negative residual there. So, you can say, given the uncertainty, it's probably okay. So, basically, this is just to help you get ideas, to, using the GAM model, to get ideas for which nonlinear transformations are interesting to look at when you transform the predictors. Another thing is, we did not do that yesterday, but what you've done today is also to look at interactions between factor levels. So you multiply them together. Now, when you have factors in a analysis variance setting, it's fairly easy to look at what is the interpretation. Say, if you have three levels, then what you have, if you look at, say, the field fertilizer case, then the question is, the parameters that you have, you have an intercept up here, that is your reference level, then the parameter, if you just look at the one that goes along this, I forgot, it's, it's the field, then you, what you get here, the estimate here is, how is this column different from that reference column. So this is here is, I'll call it B, because I use lowercase for fields, and C, and what we have down here is a low, uppercase B for the fertilizer. So those are the four parameters you have in that case. Now I know in this case you don't have repeated measurements, so you cannot estimate the interaction. But the interaction says, so this says, if you want to predict this, you just need to say B plus lowercase this coefficient plus that coefficient plus that coefficient, right? But if you have interactions, then you can have an interaction term as well for BB, and you can have an interaction for BC. So when you have the interaction, you effectively have one coefficient for each combination here. Now, if you add a third dimension, you can also have interactions in that way, and then you just keep multiplying out how many parameters you have. That is in the discrete case. What does an interaction mean in the continuous case? We had a, in this model here, let's ignore the wind because that's the nonlinear part, but just look at the temperature and the radiation. Both have positive slopes. So that means if you look at this as the ozone level, then if the temperature is increasing in this direction, and now if the uh, radiation is increased towards me, that means this is the slope, right? That is what you predict when you both have a linear dependence in that direction for temperature and this way for radiation. If you have an interaction, that means you have a product between the two. That basically means that I can do stuff like this. Everything, except this doesn't do it quite right, but you'll still have 
straight lines everywhere. So that, but the dependence on radiation in this direction depends on the value of temperature. For low values, in this case, there's no dependence. For high values, there's a high dependence on temperature, uh, on radiation. So you have some kind of a twist of the plane when you have an interaction. Basically, what you do in your prediction here, if you have an interaction between two predictors, is that you just use the product of the two as your column. But effectively, what it means is that you have a different linear slope of one predictor when you change the other, and vice versa. So, how do you see these? So, in, in this particular case, if it is such that for some values there's no slope, and for others there's a high slope, what you want to figure out is, well, is there an interaction? You want to figure out for which variables are actually the most important ones. There's something called a regression tree here. And I should just part of MF row equals C comma one comma one, not eleven. That'll be too many plots in one go. It's actually larger there. So what does this mean? First of all, those temperatures are probably in Fahrenheit. So they are meaningful as temperatures wherever you are. 82 is one of the easy ones to convert. You just flip the numbers. 28 degrees Celsius. So when it's below 28 degrees Celsius, then what happens here is that similar to what you did in the ANOVA, what we did over here was to find levels to categorize this variable, and then you find different estimates, different groups. So that's the same thing here. What happens here is that you first take temp the one place where you get the largest reduction in variance, in, like, like in the ANOVA case, is to take the temperature variable and split it, those that are above and below 82.5. Then you have two groups, and the vertical distance here, that is the reduction, that com is corresponding to the reduction in variance you get. So how much smaller are the residual sum of squares from just the, the variance of the total data set, and the variance if you just categorize into those two groups, above and below. And then we see that in both cases here, we make and then a split in wind, and then if the wind is still again slow, then the ozone level is 61, because the number at the end of each here is the ozone concentration that we expect in that case. So that is, you basically just divide your space somehow, the way to get the most, the best separation of your data. If there, if there is some wind then you want to look at radiation. If that is low, you have some value, if the radiation is larger, then as again, it depends on temperature, but then you get, again, larger concentrations. Now, if the temperature is high, all the concentrations up here are higher. So it shows that temperature really matters. The next one here is wind. If it's a strong wind, then we have, relative to all the other combinations, we have less ozone probably because then we get some fresh air in from somewhere else. And then we have again something to do with temperature here and radiation. The radiation threshold here is different, but again the degree of explanation is small. So what do we learn from this? First of all, we learn that we have temperature here. We also have temperature further down in both branches. So we should spend a lot of our focus on temperature. Whatever we can do to kind of improve that, we should think of that. What else do we learn? We learn that wind is the second most important one. The split point is different for the different cases here. Let's just go back and look at a summary of the data. Not the ozone, but the wind speeds here. The wind speeds 
are, you can say, in a quartile range is 7.4 to 11. So we're actually looking at the lower quartile, and we're looking at, you can say, the upper quartile of the data. And then we have, so basically, this split here gives us some tails of the wind speed. So that means that there's probably something different happening. I'll get to you in a moment. So when the wind, for high temperature, something happening for wind, for low temperature, it's probably something different. It's a different tail you're looking at. So probably there could be an interaction with wind. I did not estimate this in this model because I only had pluses between my terms. You had a question? Exactly. Those are the mean value of the ozone concentrations for those where the temperature in this case is below 82.5, the wind is above 7.15, radiation is above 79.5, temperature is also above 77. When the reduction in variance is not large enough. Yeah, and I forgot what it actually corresponds to, if it is an AIC style or it's a p-value, but it's pretty much looking at the bisection until there's no longer a significant support for the difference. Because otherwise you can always keep splitting. I don't recall if you can get an easy count of how many are there in each group. Um, let's just look at what is in that. That's a messy structure. So here you have all the splits in the tree, and then you have how many there are in the different groups after the different splits. I think those are the ends. So it starts out with well, how many observations do we have in total? That should be listed somewhere as well. We have 111 observations. Yeah, and then we split it. And then in the left, ah, then you ha I have to look into the order of these things. And then you look at the deviant, which is similar to the variance in each of the groups in order to figure out how is the reduction. So this, the first one here is the top before doing anything, and then you're looking, I would assume, it's what happens to the left-hand side, and then I would assume that there are only nine that has a low temperature and low wind speed. And then you have the 68 plus nine, that's 77. So that, that is the branch that is to the right hand in the left hand here. And then we start splitting that into the 18 and 50, and then the 50, is then further split into 32 and 18. And then you go to the other branch for the wind over there. So it pretty much reads from the top down and left to right. Does that make sense? So you do have actually in the groups down there, no, probably some from the top and, top and down because this split is not listed yet, the split for radiation there. So it, li it lists from the top down. Where do you get the largest reduction in variance? And how many are then in each group there? Of course, if you just read what is the name of the split, that tells you where you are. <laughs> but that's cheating, right? Um, I don't know that anything else here that is of interest. No. Yes. Sorry. Uh, in which order does it do the splits? Is it uh, just done in the way you list them, or does it do any calculations? The way it finds the split is to say, well, I have three variables. I have to pick one of them, and then I try for each of them. Where can I get the last reduction in variance by making a binary split? And then I pick that value. And then in each branch, I redo the same thing. I look at all observations in this branch. Among those, which value should I pick for each of the three? 
So you try for each of them and you figure out where do I get the largest reduction. Uh, so you keep doing what is the optimal split. Is that uh, good? So that is to both get information about nonlinearities, but also to get some things about if you have a lot of dependence on something, but only for some values, then it's also a good indication of interactions. Good. Now, I think before moving on, um, now I will say one thing about groups and then I will say the things about uh, Markdown and LaTeX combination with R code uh, afterwards. So what I've done, I'll stop the stream now.